I speak Indonesia English, okay? Yang terhormat uh, Profesor Saleh Yujel, Yujel, how many Yujel? Profesor uh, Saleh Salih Yujel dari Australia. Yang terhormat Prof. Faisal Ismail, yang terhormat Ustaz Ali, yang terhormat Pak Yus, yang terhormat teman-teman mahasiswa yang hadir pada hari ini. Insya Allah pada hari ini beberapa jam ke depan kita akan melaksanakan semacam stadium general ya, atau kuliah umum ya. Nah, itu tentang layanan pendidikan dan pendidikan agama tentang layanan pendidikan dan bimbingan agama nanti Pak Yus yang akan menjelaskan pakai English gitu ya, tentang program hari ini nah untuk itu kita mulai acara ini dengan sama-sama mengucapkan basmalah Bismillahirrahmanirrahim untuk itu yang pertama kali kami mengucapkan terima kasih banyak kepada Bapak-Bapak dan mahasiswa yang sudah hadir pada acara ini, nah untuk itu pada Ustaz Ali juga kami ucapkan terima kasih dan sekaligus untuk bisa memandu acara ini sampai dengan selesai kepada kemudian kepada Pak Yus saya minta untuk bisa menyampaikan maksud dan tujuan dari uh, pelaksanaan acara ini. itu sekali lagi terima kasih. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Dan selanjutnya saya serahkan pada Pak Yus dan Ikhmalok. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Alhamdulillah rabbil alamin. Wassalatu wassalamu ala asyrofil anbiya wal mursalin sayyidina wa maulana Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in amma ba'd. First of all, I would like to say thank you very much to speaker today, Professor Saleh Yujo. Uh, I think uh, today we are going to listen to the principles of what uh, Islamic chief you see, or Islamic counseling. Yeah, I think it is an uh, interesting topic, especially in Islamic education. And Al Makaram Al Mahdaram, said uh, Professor Saleh Ijo and Professor Dr. Faisal Ismail. And the chairperson of this program, Professor Dr. Uh, Professor Hujar Sanaki, and also uh, Professor uh, Dr. Ustad Ali as the moderator today of uh, this uh, this lecture. I think uh, this uh, program we will hold if we have chance to invite uh, speaker from Islamic studies, especially today, uh, Professor Salih Kijo from Australia, but the next speaker only did it from Turkey, from Turkey. For the reason, we are as the program first grade for the Islamic studies, Islamic University of Indonesia, we'd like to thank you very much to the speaker. And also, we told, we will go to present, uh, we will go to Students who present uh, this uh, lecture. Maybe you have a prefer several questions to ask uh, the professor of the Islamic Championship. I think uh, it is a good and interesting topic to ask to understand this. For that reason, I think uh, it's better we give chance to the professor become speaker today and also we attend to uh, Dr. Ali. Who will lead of this uh, discussion? So I think uh, uh, I give chance to Mr. Uh, Ali Abdul Munani to lead uh, this uh, discussion. And also, uh, I don't hope for uh, students to have several questions. I think uh, we have uh, spare time to uh, ask several questions on this one tangent. So that I think uh, this is all from me as a program of Islamic studies of this university and we thank you very much and wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh 
that done by Islamic educators and Islamic psychologists for people with special needs like people in hospitals, people in jails, people in orphanages. Yeah, I think it can uh, produce or deliver the right message to uh, our partners in uh, homeland, also to international community about uh, Islam. Um, our grandfathers, ulama, usually uh, speak of uh, trilogy uh, of al-mandu'a wal maqsud wal manhaj. If they are going to introduce uh, a discipline, they are usually uh, talk about al-mandu'a object, al-maqsud purpose, and al-minhaj method. So we are hope that uh, Your Excellency uh, will uh, depict for us uh, as, as, as possible as, as you can in this uh, limited time about uh, what is the object of championcy, what is the purposes of championcy, and what is the connected uh, or connecting points between championcy and the general purpose of uh, Islam or Rasul Islamia, and finally the method or methods, uh, if, if I can uh, speak rightly, yeah, about how to realize uh, those purposes uh, in a chaplainist or or, 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 or uh, yeah, in Indonesia we call it rohani yeah. How how can we uh, realize uh, those purposes uh, towards our objects? in uh, Indonesian environment, uh, of course. Uh, you can also, you may share also your uh, long experience uh, over uh, one quarter of century, yeah. 25 years you are active as a journalist. So please, uh, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Jazakallah khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Assalamu alaikum alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, uh, I would like to thank our director, Professor Stani, Ustad Ali, Professor Faisal, and all other guests, lecturers, and students to be here. It's a great uh, privilege for me, uh, you know, to talk at one of the oldest university uh, about Islamic chaplaincy. Years ago, you know, when I was reading a book, it was written by a Harvard professor, Barry Fell. In that book, name of the book is Saga America, Saga America, there's a section there that Indonesian, there was no Indonesian, but Indonesian people took Islam to America approximately 250 years before Columbus. Do you know this? Yeah. You know, but that's good, I'm sure. Yeah, 250 years before Columbus, actually Malay people, they went to America. It's written in his book. And also, you know, I like your language as well. When I was studying English, uh, was 28 years old. Uh, I learned, I tried to teach Islamic uh, scripture class in the public school. I remember I was going to discuss about wudu. So yeah, wudu. I said, uh, you know, boys and girls, when you would like to have abortion, before abortion, wash your hands. Everyone was laughing. Abortion mean, <laughs> ablution is voodoo. Abortion mean, it's different. So this English is difficult language, but Bahasa writing and reading is same. So inshallah, I, I make intention, I made intention to learn Bahasa as my sixth language, inshallah. Thank you. Thank you. Now back to my topic. Let me ask you a question. Please, not professors, not the lecturers, just students. What percentage of Islam is co conveyed 
by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam verbally. What percentage of Islam is conveyed verbally by the Prophet? A question. Just, just guess. You don't have to give me the exact answer. Probably the, the answer I know is not the exact as, as well as close. So what percentage of Islam? Any idea? I want to hear from you, yeah. Can you speak up? I'm getting old, I could hear. <laughs> what percentage of Islam was conveyed verbally, through tablet, I mean, through verbally, by, by words, by tongue? No? No, this, okay. Just guess. 70. 70? 20? 50? Okay. Well, if you look at his life, almost 90, 90% of Islam is conveyed through actions. Through actions. Because the topic is chaplaincy, I would like to bring something, you know, on the table. Person. Person through actions. 90% he conveyed the message of Islam through his actions. That's approximately, could be 85, could be 92. Some may argue 80%. But mostly, Islam was conveyed through the actions. And the reason that what you can say that what is your evidence? In the Shahada, let me say, we ashhadu anna Muhammadan abduhu wa rasul. The word of abd is coming before the word of rasul. Abd means subject, the one who practice. Rasul means the one who convey the message. Even the Shahada, you know, if someone become Muslim, what's the first thing? Shahada. But in the Shahada, the word of Abd means conveying message of Islam through actions is coming before the word of Rasul. Normally, Rasul in Islam, they are the highest position in the theology. Then, I would like to come to my topic. The word of chaplain, chaplaincy, is not Islamic, by the way. It's coming from a Christian word. Chapel, or chapel in French. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a small church. But recently, that has been developed in a secular society so rapidly, not just you know in the hospitals, as Ustad Ali mentioned, it's in the army, it's in the you know orphanage, it's in the universities, it's in the police force, even in an environment, it's in uh, schools, it's in sports, in the parliament, United States they have. Chap, you know, fa Father of Parliament has chaplains in the Parliament. So we can see that the chaplains, of course in the jails as well, <coughs> they're almost in everywhere. Although they call themselves a secular society, but the chaplains are present in almost everywhere. So this something then brings my mind one day, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. You know the story. He was serving his companion. Probably water or maybe dates, whatever. A Badawi came to the door, said, "Who is leader of this group?" Like an ugly way. He paused, smiled, 
Neyse Seyyid-ül Kavm Khadimu the, 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 the leader is the one who serves I did a research I look at the more than 30 tassirs I look at historical books I thought in Arabic why the prophet used Sayyid he didn't say Amir he didn't say Malik he didn't say Rais but he said Sayyid I look at the Quran Sayyid is mentioned twice I look at the hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa mentioned first for himself then for his grandson Hassan radiallahu anh that his descendants are called Sayyids so this means that the one who serves helps this is the core principle of the chaplaincy in the West today serving look at not talking you know we have a comedian in Turkish called Mola Nasreddin one day he went to bazaar market he saw that someone is selling parrot parrot he said how much is this he said 10 golds he went home he brought his uh, turkey they asked him Mullah, how much is your turkey? He said, 30 golds. He said, Come on, 30 golds, too much. He said, look, small parrot is 10 golds. He said that, but parrot, parrot talks. Then Mullah Nasrani said, but the turkey thinks, contemplate. So contemplation is more important than talking. That's why in Islam, serving is more important than talking, than propagating religion. So as a chaplain, as a Muslim chaplain, when you go to visit a patient, you are there, you are teaching Islam, you work with your presence. Because personally, as Ustad Ali mentioned, I have been doing chaplaincy work more than 25 years. Some of them were paid, some of them are unpaid. And now I am only the Muslim supervisor in Australia who can educate Muslim chaplains. I worked seven years at Harvard Medical School's hospital in America as a Muslim chaplain. Before that, I worked almost seven years in Australia as a Muslim chaplain for the Department of Correction in the jails. And of course, many hospitals. When I was working at Harvard Medical School's hospitals as a Muslim chaplain, I realized that something is missing in the Muslim world. Is this chaplaincy. Although the chaplain is as a Christian word, but the work of chaplain is also partially missing. Then, what can be done? I remember because I always think not just Muslims, even, even non-Muslims, that I saw that there are education programs in many divinity schools in America, in some leading hospitals. They call clinical pastoral education. Who take this course? Clergies, priests, rabbis, nuns, and some doctors, some nurses, they also take that course. It is three units, and then to be supervisor, you need another two, three education. But it is very, very interesting. What are taught is how to communicate. You know, you visit the hospital, you saw someone has radical ideas. How are you going to communicate? You saw a non-Muslim. You saw a Hindu. You saw a Buddhist. You see a very pious person. You see someone is dying. Someone has cancer. So how you are going to deal with these people? So then we call 
clinical path of education is to educate people how to deal with such issues. You know, personally, I was imam for 15 years. I thought that I knew in the beginning. But when I took the course, I realized that, no, I did not. I did not know. I realized that how this is important for an imam, for a Muslim doctor, for a Muslim nurse, you know, for a psychologist. You can count on four, even those who are running orphanage. Why? Because not religion is taught there. Communication, psychology. And plus, of course, different theological, theological issues. And plus, interfaith relations. Because we are living in a global world. Your neighbors are Christians, Catholics. Maybe other neighbor could be Buddhist. So as a Muslim, how we can communicate, how we can talk to them, which way, how many of us are aware about their culture, about their tradition. For example, let me give you an example. In the West, if a country, someone from a country does something wrong, let me say, if, please forgive me, Mr. Faisal, if you start Faisal does something wrong, you start it. If I am Indonesian in America, I should apologize from Americans. There's no sense in, in, in Muslim culture, you know. If he did, why I should apologize? But it's part of their culture. You should know aware of this. When I realized this, although I've been living in the West for many years, when the Pope a bit attacked Islam, the previous Pope, and attack Islam, Catholic priests, they came and apologize. I said, what's, why? He said, look, the Pope said something wrong about Islam and Muslims. I said, it's his responsibility, not your responsibility. So that's why we should be aware about other cultures, about faith and traditions. Then we will be able to communicate with them as well. So this is also a core principle of the chaplaincy world. And then, how it goes. The students will come together, and they will do the field education. Not just you know, read the books, present in the class, no. You will visit a patient in the hospital, maybe a child, someone is dying, or someone had heart surgery, someone had psychological problems, you will visit and then come write down a report and discuss in the class. And the other students will give you feedback. Will give you feedback. So what does it mean? Then they will tell you, or your supervisor will tell you, well, your approach, this is good. But this is needs to be improved. This is, is strong, but this is weak. <coughs> so you will discuss your communication skills, even your, you know, body language skills. You know, in the, in the West, especially in America, please forgive me, they invite you like this. In my culture, this insult. If you invite someone like this, it will hit you, bash you. So do you can see the cultural differences? And I'm learning in Indonesian culture as well in the last one and a half months, I learned a lot. And today, Mr. Ali told me that your host start eating or drinking something first, then you do it. In my culture, it's opposite. So that's why in the chaplaincy work, we have to learn about the other cultures and about also the Muslim, different Muslim types of Islam as well, different interpretations. And that will give you a skill that you will be able you know, to do the chaplaincy work. For example, how are you going to do it homeless? How are you going to help a widow? How we are going to help someone has psychological problems? You know, for Muslim imams, please forgive me, oh, he's possessed by jinns. 
Maybe, but it is not your responsibility to tell him that you, you are possessed by jinns. Then I'll, I'll, I'll become fear for me. It become worse. So what's the solution? The solution is to minimize the fear, not make the fear to grow. When you minimize the fear, you will help. And that's why here, the chaplaincy, Islam, Islamic chaplaincy education, it is necessary, I think. I have many personal experience. You know, uh, I was taking my subjects, I have not decided to do my thesis, the topic of my thesis. And one day I visited a patient, a Muslim patient in the intensified care. I asked the nurse, ask permission. She was dying. I recite Surah Yasin, I made some dua. Then I, when I was leaving the room, the nurse said, what did you do to this patient? I said, did I do something wrong? She said, no. All vital signs got better. You know, the blood pressure, heart, heartbeat, and blood circulation. And that's get got better. Hmm, I said. Then I will choose at this topic how the liquor and Quran affects the Muslim patients. And I choose my topic to do my PhD on this, uh, I mean research on this. And I have many other ex personal experience. Once I recited some Quran, a non-Muslim patient was very happy. Whenever he comes to the hospital, he would call me, call Imam, you should recite some Quran for me, because the Quran is giving me comfort. And therefore, you know, that chaplaincy program is the way, is teaching us how to serve, the methodology of how to serving the people. Not just Muslims, by the way. How to serve the people, not just Muslims. Because Sayyid al-Qaw Khadimuhum, al-Qaw, what does an al-Qaw? A tribe, a nation. Could be Muslims like in Indonesia. You have Muslim, non-Muslim, Buddhist, Atheist, you know, Buddhist, Hindus, many others. So you are going to serve everyone, not just Muslims. Sayyid al-Qaw. And then Khadimuhum. What does an Khadim? The one who serves 724. What does it mean? Seven days a week, 24 a day. Khadim is Ismail Fa'il in Arabic. Ismail Fa'il means always does. So what does it mean as a Muslim, as Muslim, what do we call Muslim chaplain, should be ready to serve every day, not just between you know, 7 a.m. till 3 p.m. Should be ready to serve. So this is the methodology. So that, then how to serve, that's the importance of educating, part of the education of chapters. The methodology. The methodology is very, very, very important. You know, if we sometimes, if our methodology is not accurate and we make a mistake, then what will happen? As Imam Ghazali says, half of the people run from the religion because of misrepresentation, because of Muslims. Half of the people leave Islam, run from Islam because of wrong methodology or inaccurate behavior of a Muslim. And also research shows that is by a professor, 92% of American who converted to Islam, 92%, they became Muslim not because of tablier. They become a Muslim because they saw a good Muslim, the action of a good Muslim. 
that is according to a Georgetown uh, professor, I forgot her name, uh, she's originally Lebanese, Yuvan Haddad, yes. Yeah. So that's why here is to serve, to serve everyone. Because I say Khadim is serving everyone in the tribe, in the group, in the nation. Doesn't say, no, you are Muslim, you are favored. Oh, no, he's not Muslim, no, no, I, I, I will neglect him, no. <laughs> no, that's not something else. So we should serve everyone equally. As the Prophet said, the Sayyid of Qawm, Khadima. So in regard to education, so the students will go in the field. I think in, in Indonesia, I like it that the students, they go one month, is it, to, to the villages, yeah. they serve. Okay. I like that, it's very good, very good. Okay. Yeah, called yes. So the similar way, in the chaplaincy, you will be in the field, more than in the class. For example, the unit I am teaching, it's 400 hours normally, 124 hours we spend in the hospitals or in the jails. And 80 hours we spend in the libraries. Then the rest will be maybe in the family and some in the classes. So the chaplain's work, I think it is a very important and as a Muslim, we are far behind. Although some of the Muslims, they are already deep doing. I heard that there's an imam in the hospitals, they are visiting the people. But when I ask, any of these imams are trained from the psychology? Do they know the psychology? Do they know the non-Muslims? Do they know those who are very secular, they don't practice Islam? They know their culture. They know how to approach them. And we are not sure. So Islamic chaplaincy is the way to equip yourself with a skill that to serve every human, even in the West where they serve even animals, which is in Islam, it's is not, is not wrong because if you look at Islamic history, one of the, again, the Harvard professor, he did a research about Egypt, about animals in Islam. He argues that during the golden age of Islam till period of colonialism, an animal would prefer to live in the Muslim society rather than in, he says, in the Christian society. But I would say that today the animals would prefer to live in the developed countries rather than the Muslim countries. This was a fact. Why? One of the uh, well-known Sufi master called Mahad al Bandi, his master Amir Kulal, you know, when he studied all the Sharia, all the Adab, and everything, and serving the people, then he said that go and serve the animals for three years. For three years. So he served the animals for three years, then he was very compassionate. If animal passed by, he would stand up, respect the animals because of such compassion. So in the, in the chaplaincy also, what it is done, that you develop your a compassion spiritual side to serve human, humanity. So if I you know, summarize my lecture, I don't want to take your time, then I'll, I'm open to any questions. Although chaplains, chaplaincy work can be seen in the Islamic society is part of the Islam, but we are not trained or educated in regard to how to do such work properly, accurately. For this reason, the methodology of today, what we call in the West, pastoral clinical education, all the theology, it will be in Christianity or could be in Judaism, I'm teaching Islamic theology in the Islamic chaplaincy, but the, the techniques of such work, I think anyone, whether imam, whether you know nurse, doctors, psychologists, social workers, 
it is very important for them to take at least one or two units for clinical pastoral education for doing his or her job better. And when we do her, when we do our job better, then there will be demand. You come, please. Such imam is helping me very well. And because of him, I, I found this one. I find the right way. Or such, you know, not just for men, for the sisters as well, by the way. Or female as well. Because half of the humanity are female. We cannot neglect them. If you educate one woman, you are educating whole family. If you educate one man, you are educating just one man. <coughs> Therefore, can be also women, especially, take such units that can develop how to serve Islam, you know, from theological, social, spiritual, psychological perspective. And I think not just Muslims as well as the non-Muslim community in this society. I will stop here, inshallah. If you have any uh, questions, you are most welcome to ask me. Personally, uh, I can tell you that I love visit patients, people in the jail, often, because the great scholar of Islam, they say that, although we know that Allah is everywhere, but he says, they say that, look, Allah, with the orphans, with the widows, with the broken heart people, with the needies, with the patients, look, you know, for spirituality with them, not just in the mosque. Don't kind of like prison Islam in the mosque. Don't prison Islam in the mosque. Go to the society. Go to hospitals, orphanage. Go to, you know, jails and, you know, homeless, needy people, broken heart people. Then you will see that how you visit even your one of your smiling face will affect heart and mind of the people. And those who brought Islam to this country and other parts of the world, they use this methodology, not talking. Maybe talks as well, but more serving humanity. That's the summary of the challenge. Serving humanity without any expectations. سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم آخر دعوة الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وبارئه أجمعين آه. جزاكم الله خيرا كثيرا if uh, you have any question that I know إن شاء الله I'll try to respond if I don't know I'll learn or if you'd like to make a comment we are also most welcome Is that the Yes, Mr. Mr. We do thank you for uh, this uh, beautiful, let's see, even beneficial also uh, presentation. Uh, now we will open the floor for questions, uh, suggestions, even uh, critics. Yes, yeah. yeah. most welcome. So, okay, from the right side maybe. Yeah, it's yes. not that. Yes, I want to know about the why it was chaplaincy. My question is why chaplaincy Islam is why was chaplaincy Islam Islamic community is it? Why is chaplaincy Islam is? Yeah, why was chaplaincy in Islamic community is it? With uh, last uh, last word, I could not, not be getting old. Why was Japanese in the Islamic community missing? Missing. Missing. Yeah. Oh, thank you. Missing. Uh, well, you know, civilizations they are like human beings. They are born, grow up, and they die. If you look at the during the golden age of Islamic civilization, we see that work is done. I can talk about the Ottoman history. There are many organizations who are doing the chaplaincy work. Not called chaplain, but doing the chaplaincy work. If you look at the hospitals, was established in, uh, in Egypt first, psychiatry even. There were musicians in the hospital. There were chaplains, imams. 
there were doctors, nurses, even hunters. You know, the patients ask him once to let me eat rabbit. They would go and hunt the rabbit and bring and cook for, for the patient. So Islamic civilization, during, during the Islamic civilization, there were many waqaf who can look at the society needs and provide such needs. But during the colonization and after the colonization, what the, what the colonization did, the most destructive from my personal experience, it is the destruction of the civil society. When there is no civil society, all of that services stop. Including, for example, if you go to Istanbul, in the historical mosque, you will see the nest for the pigeons, for the birds in, in the world of the mosques. There are many wakaf that look after the poor, needy animals, and that all of them are missing because you know, as I said, one of the things that uh, colonialism did wrong was the destruction of civil society in the Muslim world. And that stopped many things to serve the civil society. Then why we could not renew ourselves, that can be an important critical point. You know, instead of blaming others, we should be critical to ourselves. I think we haven't done our task. Because if there's no light, if a blame is dark, dark, that is already dark. Mm -hmm. But I should bring a candle and have something here. Take a step. Take a step. So the Muslims of today, they, we should focus more on internal issues. Our problem first, you know, if you look at the great scholars, Imam you know, Ghazali, he did not write any book about the Crusaders. He focused on internal issues. We cannot say, you know, Shaitan, why you are cheating me? Shaitan is Shaitan. It's Shaitan. So I think what we are doing, how come plant a seed today, 10 years later, 20 years later, it can be a tree, a fruitful tree. So in many ways, we can be critical to ourselves. I think in regard why it is missing, we have many universities, many religious institutions, Minister of Religious Affairs in this country, most of the Muslim world. I haven't seen that Imams are educated regarding psychology. I haven't seen that Imams are educated regarding to other cultures. Pluralism. Or, you know, or you, yeah, you call uh, k k k k yeah. 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 So that should be done because knowledge is power. If you don't have knowledge, you don't have power. That's a fact. A very, very good point. I, you know, I saw uh, personally, although I was well, educated for this, but still I need to develop myself a lot. I think we need to develop, to have something new always, to build this, always, yeah. talk about uh, during the Ottoman, because they existed for 600 years. If you look at in Jerusalem, if there was aid for Muslims, the Christians and Jews will come together, cook, make food, and go to Muslims' house, celebrate Eid with them. If there was Hanukkah, Muslim and Christian would gather together and go to you know, cook, give the food. There's Christmas, then 
Jews and Muslims gathered together and do this. And Ottoman brought safety and peace in Jerusalem for 400 years, 200 soldiers. 200 soldiers. Why? Even at the gate of the historical gate, they wrote La ilaha illallah, but they did not write Muhammad Rasul. <coughs> Reason because our Christian friends, Jewish friends, they don't accept our prophet. So if they come to the sea every day, it may bother them. So I think in today the Muslim world, there's one, there's a fear because of the colonialism that fear is continuing. The second, we lost such values. The values that we should respect, be careful about non-Muslim rights. And by saying that, you know, don't say Merry Christmas or don't say this, don't say this, we should leave to the people. We should leave to the people. By saying this, how many people are going to listen to? And this is going, if it's going, there's a principle we say that whatever you say, it must be truth. But it is not your responsibility to tell all the truth. Whatever you say, it must be right. But it's not your responsibility to tell to tell all the truth in the world. Why? Because sometimes the truth can cause problems. Whereas so it is haram or halal. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, <laughs> well, you should ask Mufti. I'm not Mufti. <laughs> because I'm translating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then you can say ask Mufti. <laughs> what? what? I mean, which, which Mufti? It's different. Well, that's right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I would say that before that, before saying such words, how far we are helping our non-Muslim neighbors conquering their heart and mind. So I say, you know, maybe he, he is he's asking us to focus on the necessity of labor, yeah, not the formal uh, language, yes. This course of the... Bye. Terima kasih. Thank you. Mungkin perempuan dulu, satu saja. Anda siapa sebut nama? Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Nama saya Tri Dastuti dari Pendidikan Islam. Mbak Astu, Mbak Siu. Tri Dastuti. Tri Dastuti. MSI UII Pendidikan Islam. Uh, I'm sorry, sir. I want to speak uh, Bahasa because I can speak English very well. Okay. <laughs> Yang saya tanyakan adalah tadi dijelaskan bahwa bahwasanya Tadi dijelaskan bagaimana perkembangan sedikit banyaknya tentang Islamic Jadensi ini di Indonesia Tentang misalkan bagaimana Muhammadiyah dan sebagainya Yang saya akan adalah bagaimana pengembangannya atau development untuk pengembangan itu tadi karena sebenarnya itu belum dijelaskan lebih mendalam oleh profesor itu e, itu kan untuk misalkan pelayanan umum ya kalau bagaimana dengan pandangan profesor sendiri tentang Islamic Kaplansi ini di bidang pendidikan itu terima kasih terima kasih mohon maaf assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh so how to develop Muslim supremacy in Indonesia yeah. Yeah, because she feel she feel that uh, this one uh, yeah. okay. was not covered yeah. uh, well a good question first of all, very good question I think we have to develop not by myself only as a team you know I would need a psychologist I would take you know, someone who knows the culture of this society. And I will bring what I learned from the West. And then we have to develop a program that can fit in the society. If I bring whatever is in the West, it's not going to work. And we have to localize 
and do something in the light of the Quran and the Sunnah, but including a psychologist, the one who knows the culture, of course, the one who knows Sharia, and those who are also uh, a supervisor who has experience. At least three or four people, we can develop a program that can feed. Still, it may not be accurate, gradually. Because when we apply, we will learn from the feedback and see how it goes. And then we will develop, redevelop again. So I think to develop such program, we need at least to apply two, three programs. Then we can come something more tangible for, for Indonesia. Thank you. Silakan, Ustaz. Bati, hitam putih. Serving, don't because it's a bit, you know, that English uh, and Arabic or Islam terminology sometimes does not fit. Like what? When I say patient, patient, you know, but it's not sabr only. Sabr is broader than the word of patient. Therefore, serving here, don't think that you know, we are going to serve the servant of the non-Muslim or servant of other people because we are servant of Allah, first of all. But Allah is commanding us to serve others, as the Prophet did. I, I don't mean that you are going to work as a servant you know, in someone's house or, no. But you can, there's nothing wrong with it because you can make money. However, serving here to help the people's need. What do I need? A smiling face. Okay, then you will come with a smiling face. You know what this sister needs? Maybe she needs it to get a job. Then try to ask some people to help her to get a job. What this orphan need? Maybe just wipe his hair to provide emotional support. This is serving. If you, if you ask me, <coughs> The life of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. I will summarize in three sentences. <clears throat> Number one, he suffered for the humanity, not just for the Muslims, for the humanity. Number two, he listened those who were suffering, suffering from what? From poverty to zulm. You know, from the lack of spirituality to lack of the faith. Okay, you can add anything. Those are suffering. The third is, he tried to find solution for their suffering. He tried his best for help to those who are suffering. Whole of his life can be in this, in this three sentences. So this is the role of chapter. Someone needs help, how you can help? This is serving. You don't have to be a genius person. Sometimes, you know, one of, I have a friend who's a chaplain in Australia. He does not have even religious education background. He went to the hospital with someone he did not know. The husband of the patient was a professor. And he was secular, anti-religion. And initially, he was hesitant to accept, but then he said, okay, wife is dying. He said, that, can I read a Yasin? He said, yes. After reading the Yasin, even the secular professor started weeping, crying. 
and then say, can you come next week as well? Yes. The power of the Quran, the power of sincerity. So serving me, whoever is in need, go and help. Don't say, even, even not human, even animals, don't say that you, know, you are black, you are white, you are a professor, you are a boarding man, no. Help everyone. You know, like the sun. So there is no limit. Yeah. No limit. There is no limit. As much as you can. Thank you very much. Perempuan ada silakan namanya siapa? Thank you. Uh, my name is Fatiha. <coughs> Fatiha. Yeah. Fatiha. Nice. Good evening. Welcome here to speak in Indonesia. Because I'm not uh, speaking in Korean. Um, saya tertarik tadi dengan yang disampaikan oleh Profesor Sony. Bahasanya memang Islam uh, um, tertinggal jauh dari hal-hal yang harusnya diperhatikan ketika kita menyampaikan uh, beberapa hal tentang Islam. Saya setuju bahwasanya apapun yang disampaikan tentang Islam itu tidak melulu pada perkataan saja, tapi um, lebih ditekankan pada aksinya seperti itu. Cuman uh, permasalahannya yang yang sering saya lihat mungkin saya masih muda ya dan belum seberpengalaman uh, bapak-bapak dan ibu yang ada di sini uh, yang saya sering dengar beberapa orang yang menyampaikan tentang agama itu hanya melulu tentang akhirat saja mereka tidak menyinggung tentang dunia jadi ketika beberapa peserta yang mendengarkan apa yang sudah disampaikan tentang Islam itu dan sudah ditekankan dengan akhirat saja uh, orang-orang akan merasa mereka sudah puas dan mereka oke okay, kita sengsara di dunia kita nanti akan bahagia di akhirat seperti itu itu jadi seperti dogma jadi kayak um, beberapa peserta yang mendengarkan saya tidak bilang itu peserta pengajian beberapa peserta yang mendengarkan hal-hal yang disampaikan tentang agama itu mereka akan merasa oke okay, cukup kita tidak masalah kita hidup sengsara di dunia uh, akan dijamin Tuhan kita hidup bahagia di akhirat itu jadi semacam Apakah itu yang membuat Islam uh, jadi tertinggal jauh seperti itu? Kemudian uh, ada juga um, konkretnya kita nanti sebagai um, penerus, penerus generasi karena kita tentu muda dan suatu saat kita pasti akan dimintai beberapa hal uh, tentang apa itu Islam, bagaimana Islam dan di dalamnya Islam itu seperti apa saja. Itu nanti seperti apa agar kita juga bukan cuma mendoktrin bahwa memang di akhirat itu nanti hidup uh, bahagia Tapi kemudian kita jadi malas-malasan di dunia seperti itu Terima kasih So how to balance, how to balance uh, between the hereafter oriented discourse and the worldly da'wah discourse yeah. in balance between those uh, orientations? Yeah. Well, uh, very, very good question. Very good question. I think it is very simple in Islam. Very simple. Niya. Intention. Yeah, when you have intention to study in this university, it is for hereafter as well. For sake of Allah. You know, when you have intention to visit someone, you can visit for sake of money as well, then no hereafter. Or, but if you visit for sake of Allah, it's for hereafter. You can study in this university to have a good job, no hereafter. But if you study here to make halal money, to help the people, it is for this world and for the next, not both. The niya is the key. With the good intention, you can make you know, 24 hours as like Nibada. Like what? You know, when I walk, exercise, I say Allah, Allah, Allah. It's Ibadah. You know, when I visit someone, I say I should visit for the sake of Allah, it's Ibadah. When I sleep, I have my wudu, I make my dua, I have intention to wake up, inshallah, for tajj if I can, if not tajj for, for Salat and Fajr for sure. <coughs> then, till I wake up, it's Ibadah. When I work, is ibadah. So you can make whole of your life as ibadah. With what? 
intention. Yeah. I think Imam Shafi Rahmatullah mm -hmm. says half of the religion is intention. <coughs> okay, so, so uh, I will uh, exploit my authority sure. uh, to ask a question. Uh, okay, okay. Please, please. I thought that you already gave up. <laughs> <laughs> community for the Islamic chaplaincy, I think we can bring these people together, coordinate. Let me say, who is head of the program in Muhammadiyya? Who is head of the program in the state universities? Who is head of the program in Nahdat Ulama or other groups? We can have maybe have an organization like in the West, they call National Chaplains Organization, something like that, like an umbrella, a head, and we can come together maybe once a month and how we can develop such program better and how we can serve this community better. I think that's possible. And maybe, inshallah, within your uh, next visit in February, we can... Uh, I think it is good if we have a meeting with them yeah. you know, to see what they are doing. I, I will learn from them as well. You know, I. I love to learn as well. And sometimes a young child, a smiling face, teach me, teach me a lot. So inshallah, yes, if you have a committee, learn from each other, work as a team. This is the best. OK, other questions? OK, please. Bagaimana kita 
mempunyai empati kepada orang lain ketika saya bekerja di Women Crisis Center itu ada banyak kasus-kasus kekerasan terhadap perempuan maupun anak yang ketika uh, kita ini merefer kepada seorang tokoh agama atau pendidik itu ya untuk memberikan uh, psikologi secara religius itu kita kesulitan pertama adalah kesulitan karena paradigma para tokoh agama itu sangat bias gender kedua mereka mana tidak uh, merangkul para korban tetapi marah uh, malah apa ya setidaknya menghakimi korban ya uh, dengan dengan memakai hadis-hadis yang misoginis nah uh, ketika uh, nah yang saya yang ingin saya tanyakan bagaimana kita untuk melatih ini kan sepertinya kan menjadi kebutuhan menjadi kebutuhan bahwa uh, memberikan pelatihan khusus kepada uh, para pendidik agama khususnya supaya mereka bisa empati kepada para korban seperti itu sampai terima kasih matur terima terima matur so uh, uh, this lady is working actually for a center for crisis rehabilitation and uh, she wonders sometimes they are searching for uh, advice from kiai or from ustad but those ustads uh, are biased or uh, gender biased yeah? uh, in the name of religion by using ayat and hadith uh, they uh, provide the uh, the wrong advice yeah. uh, and maybe uh, blame the, the, the victim. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, very, very good point. I agree with you. This is happening in every way in the world, not just here, unfortunately. Uh, that's why I think we need to revisit our methodology that how we can treat man and woman equally instead of blaming you know this and this we should see the good side both sides of them try to reconcile by blaming women becoming biased it's not going to solve the problem it will create more problems this is uh, unfortunately is happening in everywhere you know, yes, in the, in the Muslim society it is more in agenda, but in other societies as well. In America, every year, 3,000 women are being killed because of honor killing, but no one will discuss this. If it happened in the Muslim world, it will be discussed. So the point here is that we need to revisit, to reconsider, including our teachers, imams, social workers, you know, to the methodology. If you look at Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, can you tell me one hadith that he's blaming Abu Jahl? <coughs> no. No one can tell me that the Prophet said Abu Jahl damn to you. He's a head, an arch enemy. Abu Sufyan, he was his enemy for twenty <coughs> years. <coughs> yeah. So. You know, we say that, this is part of my culture, Allah gives us two eyes. With one of your eye, you should see the good side of others. With other eye, you should see your faults, shortcomings, and weaknesses. In regard to your, you know, the problem that you mentioned, I agree with you. And unfortunately, it is happening in every way, including the Muslim world by blaming, but it does not bring the solution. And it creates more problem. They maybe sometimes give a fatwa that was given 100, maybe 500 years ago. That fatwa may not be relevant for today. Why then you can say, if you look at the fatwa of Imam Azam Abu Hanifa and, and his students, sometimes are different. The fatwa of Imam Azam, Imam Shafi, rahmatullahi, and his students, sometimes they're different. And later scholars, they're different. 
the fact that the Kiai or, or, or Imam is bringing it may be right, but may not be relevant for today. You know, we should respect that fatwa, that scholar. But we keep, should keep in our mind that every scholar is the scholar of his time. And not always all fatwas, I'm not saying that all of his fatwas are most awful. Most of them may be accurate, but some of them may not be relevant. It's accurate, but may not be relevant. Thank you. Yeah. Now, now I'm going to exploit my authority, excuse me, to ask uh, one, one or, or one and a half question. Uh, yeah. uh, excuse me, I'll, I'll use the whiteboard. <laughs> so if we are going to, to, to understand the chaplaincy system, yeah. so we have the, the chaplain, Yep. Thank you. And uh, needy. Yeah. And of course, as I detect from your uh, actually manfaat kabir discussion, that needy is uh, moving within a context. Yeah? Yes. So there is the context. of the needy, it's, it may be culture or... Yeah. So, among those three variables, if I ask your excellency to uh, just uh, mention three values, Islamic values, that is going to govern the relation between the chaplain and the needy, the chaplain and the context of the needy, what are the, the, the main values yeah. within our established Quran and Sunnah? Yeah. Well, first of all, uh, we should not expect anything. What does it mean? You know, we are there not to make money, to not be applauded. Even don't expect a thanking. So the key is ikhlas. Yes. And number two, even the result, you may help, but you may not get the results straight ahead. Why? Abu Siddiq, he conveyed a message to his father. His father became Muslim 20 years later. We are not better than Abu Siddiq, Radhi Allah. We should do our task. Result is from Allah, not from us. So patience? Patience. And third, istighfar. <coughs> you can say, how? Did I do anything wrong? No. When we say, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah during salat, why, why do we call astaghfirullah? <laughs> the reason may be our salat not perfect. Maybe shaitan can bring to Salih's mind. Salih, you are praying, you are better than those who are not. I mean istighfar. After every success, your nafs will think that it's from me. No, it's from Allah. Yeah. Ras Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, when he conquered the Mecca, according to scholars, the Surah Al-Nasr was revealed. إِذَا جَاءَ بِسْمِ اللَّهِ الرَّحْمَنِ الرَّحِيمِ إِذَا جَاءَ نَسْرُ اللَّهِ الْفَتْحِ وَرَأَيْتَ النَّاسِ يَدْخُلُونَ فِي دِينِ اللَّهِ فَاجَةً فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكُ وَالسَّلْفِرِ When see the help of Allah comes, the people are becoming Muslim group by group, tribe by tribe. Allah has commanded the Prophet, what? The letter of F in Arabic means try the hat. Say subhanallah. And the, 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 the main values within the relation between chaplain and the context of the needy. Yeah. I think here, his family, yeah. we should value their culture. Know about the culture and value it. You know, we may disagree. We may disagree with the culture of a Buddhist sometimes, or the culture of an atheist, or a culture of a secular person. But respect and it is different, belief is different. So respect every culture. Rasulullah stand up when a Jewish funeral passed by. Why? Respect. 
we can give many examples like that from the life of Rasulullah Sallallahu and the Sahabas as well. To respect their values, culture, belief, whatever they have. It may be right, may be wrong. So, the last one, I think. Another value? Yeah, after the second four. You know, ikhlas, sabr, results from Allah, six, after success, make istighfar, and respect the values. Yeah. So, the half question is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the second question. Second question. Uh, second question. Half, half. Uh, I half. said one and a half question. <laughs> the, the half question is. As-sailu, as-sailu a'lam nasai. As-sailu a'lam nasai. Your Excellency. Stop. Just a sound. Just a sound. You mentioned that. Yes. We are badly and badly need actually yeah. to uh, establish uh, educational programs for chaplaincy. Yes. So we have the another player now is the education, yeah. the techniques, or the trainer, yeah. the trainer institution. Now, what are the main values? That in the line between that, 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 the candidate of being a chaplain and the education institution? Well, first of all, we should know that we are in need of this education. Dr. Ilm al Mahdi is part of our, you know, our service. We, we should know that we are in need of that. We need, we are in need. And second, I will say that be like, we should be like a honeybee. You know, collect the wisdom from everyone, not just from Salah. Could be starting a fight, right? Could be starting a, even sometimes a student will come, will teach, will teach us. I learn a lot from my students. Imam Ghazali says, I am the student of my students. So I think in education, be like honeybee, collect from everywhere, make honey, and then present it. That's our point. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Okay. Okay, you guys stop. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Ada yang masih mau tanya? Boleh lah, satu menit. Ada? <laughs> Oke. Okay. Ya. Ya. Sayyid Ramar, 
because before he was a Muslim, he was sorry, he was a mushrik. And even his sister brought a piece of the Quran to him. Gave to him. Yes. First of all, we are not obliged to apply Sharia to non-Muslims. <laughs> no. You know, if they would like to borrow the Quran, they can. We cannot say, no, 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 you cannot borrow. We can, especially online, it's available. You know, I, I would say that go and ask Shaykh Google. <laughs> <laughs> so I think the one way is today, unfortunately, some of, because there's a, a section in the history of Islam that uh, they did not allow the non-Muslims take the Quran or touch the Quran. It is not just for the non-Muslims, even for the Muslims. However, in the application of that, if someone is interested to Islam, would like to know about Islam, would like to read about the Quran, we cannot say no. I think. You know, what kind of people they are, I don't know, you should ask them how, how you can say this, you know, uh, that the a non-Muslim cannot read the Quran. I think they are narrowing the Islam, making Islam that no one can practice. Islam is a wider religion. You know, it includes everyone. It includes everyone. We should look at even our non-Muslim friends. You mentioned a good point, they are tolerant. To be tolerant is attributes of believer. So they are Muslim by actions. Maybe by faith they are Christian, but their actions is Islamic. But a Muslim, your friend, other Muslims, they are Muslim by faith, but not Muslim by actions. You understand? So therefore, we should look at everyone. You know, a non-Muslim could be honest. Oh, he's a non-Muslim. No, he's honest. Honesty is an attribute of a believer. He's a hard worker, mashallah. He's very kind to his neighbors, excellent. He's looking after the animal's pet. This is Islam. So, we call such people Muslims by actions. And we call the Muslims who are not, as you mentioned, their actions are non-Islamic. Thank you very much. So, Terima kasih banyak karena ini adalah esensi saya bicara bahasa Indonesia saja ya. Jadi insya Allah file ini silakan kalau mau diminta kapan saja dan pada siang hari ini alhamdulillah kita sudah lalui dengan berkah dan lancar alhamdulillah sekitar satu setengah jam membicarakan masalah kerohaniawan atau praktik dukungan agama bagi orang yang lagi perlu intinya dari narasumber kita yang sudah berpengalaman 25 tahun dalam bidang itu bahwa memang kita masih kurang dalam bidang ini dan perlu untuk mempelajarinya yang kedua bahwa pada komunitas agama lain layanan itu sudah maju sekali yang ketiga bahwa layanan itu memerlukan perangkat pengetahuan yang bersifat interdisipliner tidak hanya pengetahuan agama saja yang kelima dan itu juga berita gembira insya Allah pada bulan Februari tahun depan beliau akan selama sebulan di sini secara sukarela untuk membina kader sekitar 20 orang insya Allah pada waktunya kita akan buka pintu untuk pendaftaran ya sebelumnya dan insya Allah Ustaz, can you can we bring give them your information or your email? Yeah, sure. Well, if you just are you are you available to receive questions or? Yes, yes, sure. You you always are most welcome. And if you ask Sheikh Google, just write down my name. Everything will come up. Your email address, my email. I mean, excuse me. Are there any real chances to have correspondence with you? Sure, sure. They can email me. If you email, I'll be happy. If not the same day, if I'm busy, maybe not the same day. Inshallah, generally I respond to my all emails. Okay, I'm quite good on that, you know. Okay, alhamdulillah. Jadi, 
Mbak-mbak, mas-mas yang mau insya Allah berhubungan langsung dengan beliau bisa juga ya insya Allah Sambil kita menunggu tahun depan insya Allah pada bulan Februari Yang e, mau ikut silakan insya Allah dengan harapan e, MSI dan e, Miami sekarang ya Miami 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 Kesalahan, kehilafan, kekurangan khususnya dalam terjemahan maklum karena mungkin ya, terlalu cepat ya. Terima kasih banyak. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.